What's cracking, big dogs? Nick's is over there watching porn, so I'm going to kick off the intro today. Uh, look, man, it's been a long week. Been a long week for everyone. Uh, it's your boy's birthday weekend. I'm wearing joggers now for the first time in my life. Uh, I know Nick's, Nick, Nick's been rocking joggers a while. I mean, I've been, I've seen, oh, yeah, there you go. There I have no pants go. on, so I can't show you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, man, look, it's been a fun week. Uh, a lot of crazy scoring, I'd say, right? Like, I mean, I don't know how you guys do on your fantasy teams, but like my teams are basically like boom or bust. Like some teams just fucking smash and other teams just. There was a lot of shitty games. I feel like every weekend up to this point, we've just gotten over unders of like 57 points. And then this week we have fucking 16 to six, the Raiders versus the Browns. There's a lot of (laughs) shitty players and a lot of like random people scoring touchdowns and stuff and uh, a lot of injuries. So you have a lot of like backup running backs, you know, whether it's 49ers like DJ Dallas and Gio and those guys kind of popping off and, um, Weird week, yeah, um, but like we discussed prior to this podcast kicking off, everything just fucking stinks pretty much. <laughs> yeah, my home league, I lost to a guy that started two inactive players, so I'm feeling real good right now. <laughs> that's that the, that's the one that, you auto-drafted, right? That's you auto-drafted. Yeah, it's, it's not been a good year for me. <laughs> Dude, is there I, a buy-in? Is it free or is it a buy-in? It's 100 bucks. <laughs> well, I don't know how to in that tactic. <laughs> fucking irresponsible. I was in my MIA. work league. My work league's 100 bucks, and uh, I opened up that draft with Saquon Barkley and George Kittle. So, mm. first two round picks in the gutter. <laughs> Jonathan Taylor looking like fucking <laughs> poor man Trent Richardson. So, yeah, it's not going good. It's not going good, guys. But uh, we do still have some positive insights. But before we talk about all that shit, man, Noah, you know what time it is. What time is it? All right, uh, so we're going to run through the games, our regular format here. Uh, no theme other than, like Nick said, everything fucking stinks. Um, <laughs> your team stink, your players stink, your mama stinks probably. Who knows? <laughs> um, but let's kick it off with the first game of the week. Uh, Nick's favorite team, the home team, Atlanta Falcons, pulling out a W. Rare, rare. The rare W, the full moon W against the Carolina Panthers, um, who also stink, to be quite honest with you. So, Stink versus stink. I mean, there wasn't too much to really go into here other than Julio pulled a classic Julio game. You know, 10 targets, 7 receptions, 137 yards, 0 fucking tutties. Just a classic for Julio. I I think, you know, one thing that really came out of this game that's just just brutal is uh, Calvin Ridley. Do do we know what injury he has um, so far? Is is it like an ankle injury or foot injury? I think it's a mid-foot sprain. Uh, Yeah. if that's correct, and they have either grade one or grade two. If it's grade one, it's going to be like a week or two. If it's grade two, it could be anywhere from like three to six. I haven't really seen any updates on it. For some reason, every time there are injuries in like the Thursday games, I guess they don't they don't make them report on it until the following like Monday or Tuesday. So we haven't heard much. I do think he's almost definitely going to be out for uh, next week's game and could possibly linger into the – oh, they got to buy after the Broncos. So, I mean, he could be back versus Saints if this is only grade one. Yeah, let, let's hope for that because he was having a fucking stellar season as a wide receiver one and it's just, just balling out of control. Um, I mean, more interestingly, though, fucking Todd Gurley is is now, I guess, the running back five on his own depth chart. I mean, he was <laughs> yielding snaps to Quadre Olison, yielding snaps to Brian Hill. Uh, Matt Ryan looked like he was a better Todd Gurley than Todd Gurley was out there running the ball. I mean, 18 carries for 46 yards, zero fucking receptions saved himself with the fall and touchdown in classic girly fashion. I feel like, I feel like, you know, at, on this channel, at least we told you to fade most of these old guys, like Gurley, the Gordons, uh, uncle Lenny's and all, all the sorts. And, you know, David Johnson, obviously, and people were taking mad laps after like the first, like three or four weeks, like, yo, told you these guys are good. And it feels like, you know, people just forgot there was a whole second half of the season to be played. Yeah, so, I mean, Todd Gurley stinks, but he's still, what, like the RB4 on the season because he has like, like nine touchdowns? Yeah, he's the RB4 in his backfield, but also the RB4 in fantasy <laughs> overall. Like, it makes no sense. I was, I was going to tweet something out today. I was going to tweet out a blank uh, statistic post, but it was just like super fucking annoying, and I would hate if someone did this. But it was just like the rushing yards, yards per carry, targets and receptions, and the first player was going to be Todd Gurley. Second was going to be David Johnson. Third was going to be David Montgomery. And like Gurley was the least impressive by far out of those – three guys from a statistical standpoint, but it's just like Gurley scores two touchdowns every game. 
it's really yeah. fucking annoying, but I feel like it will catch up to him. And I'm not sure what happened to him in this game in particular. Like there was obviously something going on there. I saw him like stretching out his, he was like kicking up his feet and like stretching out his hamstring on the sideline. Mm-hmm. It seemed like there was definitely some sort of injury um, that happened to him. If he was, I don't know if he got fucking what, what would really happen, but they, they started throwing out like fucking their RB fours and fives on the team. So I had to assume that, I don't know what was happening, but Brian Hill kind of stinks too, to be honest. Uh, everyone on our team stinks except for Julio right now. Yeah, Julio. Uh, Hayden Hurst had a little bit of a little bit of outing there. You know, he wasn't completely trash, so I guess that was good to see. But I mean, this entire game was kind of like was kind of bad. I mean, it was no, it was nothing like the first time they met. You know, where Todd Gurley went off against the league bottom, like bottom of the league rushing defense, and then Carolina went off against like bottom of the league passing defense. It was like a light show. Uh, this week just wasn't so. I mean, the only one that went off was fucking Curtis Samuel. Uh, who scored like two touchdowns, including like a rushing touchdown and a receiving touchdown. Not much yardage, so I wouldn't get too excited over there. But I think, you know, one yeah, interesting cares. takeaway is like Mike Davis, the God, is no longer Mike Davis, the God. I think it goes to show like, you know, getting that workhorse ball. I mean, C Mac's going to be back next next week. C Mac's Yeah, yeah, back. exactly. I mean, but like, it's something to be said, you know, like for the workhorse running back, all the running backs don't matter type stuff. Like, not everyone can kind of do and take the workload that CMC does and still produce. So, something to be said there. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that game because the game fucking stinks. Um, we've already spent way too much time yeah, on it. already <laughs> spent way too much time we're gonna spend no time on the philly dallas game because yeah it was just bad I mean, let's just sum trash. it up both quarterbacks fucking stink and i wouldn't <laughs> be surprised if like more people said that carson Wentz is worse than ben denucci i mean the guy's been in the league for what three years and ben denucci and him went like wire to wire that game was that game was terrible <laughs> travis was... travis fucking Fogum. Fogum is is really good bro he looks really good out there um what are you guys what, paying for him? Could this be like an Adam Thielen type of breakout for you guys? Like, what are you what are you paying for Travis Fulton? Because I I have some views on this. I've sold him in a couple of leagues and bought him a couple. So you sold? Yeah. Um, I would. Man, I don't know if I if I have the balls to to send something like really worth a value right now. Only because we it, it seems like he's becoming the guy because there's no one else there again. He's like almost Greg Ward of last year, but obviously he's a lot better than Greg Ward is. But we'll see Rager get you know, push back into the offense more. Uh, they have neither of their tight ends really working at, you know, full speed right now, which is such a big part of Wentz and, and where he throws his targets. We don't have Miles Sanders out there. So it's, it's tough to say, but I mean, he, he legit looks like someone you could trust as a, as a wide receiver too. Almost like someone, almost like a Devontae Parker kind of out there that has, you know, a really solid floor and, and can end up be so consistent over the course of the year that he finishes as a top 15, top 12 guy. Um, I don't, I don't know if I'd be willing to send uh, anything more than, I think the right price is probably like a mid second, mid to, mm-hmm. you know, a- around that range. And honestly, I, uh, I I would do it if I was in dire need of a wide receiver to finish out the year. Yeah, Adam has a throw in that deal I did with Brett. I think I gave him Juju in a late first for Tyler Lockett, Fulgham, and a late first or a late second. So I think like that type of price isn't probably something you're not going to be able to get right now. I did it before this past week. But as you were saying, Nick, like, where Greg Ward was good last year, he was just running out of the slot, getting peppered with targets. Fulgham's on the outside, dominating coverage, dominating in the red zone. Uh, they seem to have a really good r- rapport, despite him not being there in the offseason all too much. So I think that uh, going forward, at least this year, he's going to be the wide receiver one and the top target in this offense. And as we've said before, like the Philadelphia schedule upcoming, is it's, it's beautiful. They only have like one tough matchup for the rest of the year. Uh, anytime you get to play the Dallas Cowboys, it's going to be beautiful. Even though this game wasn't like great, he still put up a, a pretty decent performance. So I like him going forward as like a middling wide receiver too. Yeah, he's got he's had seven targets or more every single week except for that first week he stepped on the field, and he's had four TDs in uh, four out of five weeks. So, like I, I believe that targets are earned uh, by good players, and he he actually looks pretty damn good. I mean, in a couple of weeks where I'm rebuilding, I ditched him because I don't want to take on the risk of him potentially not being there once Rager takes over and once uh, once Goddard comes. So I sold him. Uh, I sold him for a third, like somewhere like pretty early, um, but I sold him for a second in two leagues as well. And I think really like if you're a, if you're looking to trade him, you should be trying to get a second or maybe like you send like Fulgham plus like a third for a second or something like that. It's kind of like just lock in that value is what I would be looking to do um, because you kind of take that risk away. But yeah, he looks good, man. I think uh, it's hard to like kind of doubt what he's been doing. It's not like he's just getting, you know, he's just falling into the end zone and getting a lot of empty like touchdowns. Like he's getting a lot of yardage. Uh, he looks good out there as a number one. So, you know, he's facing like the top corners. Uh, you know, he even did good against uh, freaking Bradbury. And and uh, I guess who did he go against against the Ravens? 
um, probably Peters. So, and yeah, then he obviously had that good. monster game against Pittsburgh. So he's been going up against like pretty tough competition and getting it done. So, uh, and, and teams around contending, I'm basically just riding him because that's like a free wide receiver too that you got off the waivers. And if he's not around next year, so be it. But I'm trying to win championships. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I want to cover there. Uh, well, not much Ronald else. Jones is officially going to retire right now. I believe he just caught a pass and then fumbled it within like two steps and he's going. To, <laughs> and Mike, to remember the with. beginning of the show? You said fade Leonard Fournette. He literally yeah. is like now a running back one going forward. Yeah. Oh no, they have the ball. Oh no, wait, it's tipped. It tipped. Oh, it got tipped. He caught it. Uh, was his knee on the ground? No, that's a fumble. He, his knee was on the ground. He stood up and then he fumbled it. DJ's gonna score right here. It's DJ to Ingram right here. I guarantee it. He didn't even guarantee like. What the, that was a fucking terrible fumble. He didn't even get his hands on the ball. Dude, Ronald awful. Jones just looks so dumb trying to catch the ball. He tried to <laughs> catch that shit with his fucking forearms, man. That's I know. Why, like, what are you that's doing? Why you can't trust Ronald Jones in the fucking passing game, man. I mean, he, Tom Brady he must good. be so, so pissed. I mean, that is a tough catch, though, I guess, because the yeah. lineman hit it with his forearm, so it was, like, spinning yeah. around. Like, you got to secure the ball, bud. I'm surprised uh, Brady hasn't gone off and just been like, you have to get Fournette in on every fucking passing down. Like, I'm not throwing the ball to Ronald Jones again. I'm surprised Brady <laughs> hasn't, like, uh, just fucking chucked it as hard as he could at Ronald Jones' face one time. Just, <laughs> like, make a fool out of him. Third was movie career fumble that? lost. Okay, that's this is the longest yard when they just fucking threw it as hard as they could at the ref. I think it hit him in the in the nut. All right, whatever. Um, let's continue. Sorry. All right, let's continue here. Let's rattle off some games. Uh, this is the one we can probably talk about. I mean, Seattle Russell Wilson looked like a fucking beast as always. DK Metcalf further cementing himself. You guys have him as your wide receiver, dynasty wide receiver one. Yeah, he's Pittsburgh. been there. You do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he balled out. Uh, like especially in that second touchdown in the end zone, like th- he had the defender draped all over him and Russ was like, I don't care. I'm throwing to this guy. So uh, you kind of love to see it because Russ is unstoppable on the deep ball. So his target accuracy plus DK Metcalf is going to be a fucking beautiful, beautiful sight to come. I tell you um, nothing. Oh, Dita Dallas, I guess he balled out. So let's talk about him a little bit. I mean, literally everyone else is injured. So uh, I had to start DJ Dallas in a, in a few leagues and thankfully I did. Didn't really look that great on the ground, albeit it's against a tough San Francisco 49ers defense. But he got it done through the air and on the ground in terms of touchdowns, uh, which you do like to see. What, what do you guys think about DJ Dallas? I remember, Nick, you liked him uh, in the offseason, right? Yeah, I was excited. Uh, I, I ended up throwing him into one or two of my lineups this weekend, too. Um, and I was nervous because I think San Fran, as they start to get healthy, this will be a defense that you're, like, you know, a little bit nervous to start your running backs against. And this was it. But, like, you're in Seattle's offense. You're – going to get those opportunities like left and right and that's why he scored two touchdowns um dj was a guy i was excited about but i was a little nervous because the reason i was excited about dallas is because he actually has a three down skill set like you know you you see a, like a thicker guy like him and a guy who's not necessarily like fast breakaway and you're like oh he's probably not going to play on third downs or catch a lot of passes but as we talked about he was like a former wide receiver in high school and his first couple years in college so i knew he had that ability so i'm like okay if, if these guys are going to be out like, like i was hoping Travis Homer was inactive too because I thought he was going to play a pass catching role if he wasn't but they ended up just sitting him on the sideline and it was good to see that they had trust in in uh in Dallas to get you know 20 whatever touches he had 22 23 so um I I honestly expect Carson and Hyde to still be like really close to game time decisions maybe both of them inactive again and if that's the case I'll be rolling out Dallas uh with pretty pretty high confidence like you said not it didn't look good on the ground um but give me that volume and in Seattle's offense you're going to keep getting scoring opportunities yeah, I think – I'm not sure when Rashad Penny is coming back anyway, so, like, I definitely don't think DJ Dallas has any type of long-term value in this offense. But as Nick said, when you're part of, like, the Seahawks offense or even Tampa Bay, if you're not fumbling the ball, you're going to be able to score touchdowns if you're the only option there. Not sure, who, not sure who they're playing this week, but it's the San Francisco 49ers that he just tore apart. I'm pretty sure whoever, like, he goes up against, he can provide high in RB2 value just because you're going to see the volume there. Yeah, they're playing up against the Bills. So, uh, you know, a, a mediocre defense, not nothing that crazy. Um, on the San Francisco Niners side, we lost fucking George Kittle for the season. So, fuck that. I have him on a bunch of my teams. Uh, rest in peace. I think he's out like eight weeks with a broken broken foot or something like that. So, yeah. I mean, to all you people that uh, love doing that late round tight end strategy, I mean, we're, we're halfway through the season and only George Kittle, Darren Waller, and Travis Kelsey have more than 14 points per game. So, late round tight end not looking beautiful at this hey, point. Hey, Herbert, watch it. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Tight end one. Ultimately got it done. Brandon Ayuk, though, man. This is someone that I hated on uh, before the season. Nick, I remember you liked him. Uh, he He's looking pretty damn good in the absence of Debo. 
And I think, you know, now with George Kittle out as well, that kind of like, that kind of really opens the doors for him. He got 11 targets, eight receptions, 91 yards and a tutty. Uh, where do you, what do you think about Ayuk like going forward? You guys, are you guys buying? Are you guys selling? Are you guys holding it's, wherever you have Similar them? like the Philly situation of, of Fulgham or like Ward with last year. Just, they don't have any weapons. So, you know, you're going to make plays. It's an offense that will move because Kyle Shanahan will make it move, you know, by, yep. by force or whatever. If I, if C, if Samuel's not there, if Kittle's not out there, like Ayuk is a floor of eight to 10 targets and you know, they're going to have creative ways to get him open. You know, there's going to be tons of yak wherever he's getting the balls, like he's going to get the valuable touches over there. So if those guys are out, I mean, he's pretty much a lock and loaded top 15 wide receiver, especially in a matchup like this against Seattle. Like this was the most obvious, you know, blow up game that you could have seen coming. Um, yep. If Debo's back on the field, it just it, – to me, this almost feels like a wash season for Debo. It feels like we're not going to get – you know, maybe if if, 40, if the 49ers make a run towards the playoffs, like maybe we'll get full-strength Debo, um, you know, the playoff round, the wild card round, or divisional round or some shit like that. But it feels like regular season-wise, this is Ayuk's uh, season to kind of take over and cement himself as fantasy. And for next year, I'll be buying in on Debo as the value play over Ayuk because I don't know if he could actually do this – with other people competing for targets. That's interesting. I can't wait so for Shanahan to Debo. spend another second round pick on a receiver and make Debo Samuel, Dante Pettis, and then turn Ayuk into Debo Samuel, who's Dante <laughs> Pettis, and just like continue this trend Cycle. of turning good players bad. That's what they do, do with you their do running backs. Debo over, over uh, Ayuk? I would take, yeah, I would take Debo uh, long-term. Yeah, definitely. They seem like okay. carbon copies, but like Debo did it for a full season. And he looked really good doing it. He did it well in college too. Not to say Ayuk didn't, uh, I just have a lot more faith in Debo Samuel because as a rookie, he put up like 900 yards and he was just a mainstay in that offense and a focal point of that offense basically the whole year. Yep. Next up on the slate, uh, let's bring back some painful memory, memories for Noah here. It was looking all wheels up for the Chargers and Herbert the God until Drew Locke. Until I tweeted that Drew Locke stinks, then they came back and threw three tutties <laughs> and upset the Chargers with a – Late game heroic comeback. Um, was it even I mean, like an upset though? I think we all kind of knew it was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, you have you and me are like identical twins with this shit now. Between <laughs> being Falcons and Chargers fan, it's like there's it's never enough. You can never have a big enough lead where you feel safe at this. Well, point. the win probability was ninety eight point nine. It wasn't ninety nine. So we're, we're I hate those. I fucking bad. hate those things so much, dude. <laughs> the win probability things, and then they're always like, "Look what it was." I'm like, "Bitch, that just means your shit is terrible. Like that means your <laughs> product be is buffer for the Falcons bad. and Chargers." Yeah. <laughs> um, look, Philip Lindsay on, on the other side of the ball, six carries for 83 yards. He broke one, obviously, for a long touchdown. Philip Lindsay is just better than Melvin Gordon. I mean, we said that in the offseason, and it just remains to be true. Freaking Deshaun Hamilton, I didn't even know this guy was still in the fucking league, to be honest with you. He got four receptions, 82 yards, and one touchdown. Jerry Judy continues to not separate himself from a cast of mediocre receivers, not the generous talent we felt he was. Um, I think, you know, more interestingly on the Chargers side of the ball, we said this, you know, all offseason, Keenan Allen was a value, but we didn't know it was going to be like this. Justin Herbert is basically going to make Keenan Allen a wide receiver one for the foreseeable future. So if you have a contending team, you should be making all kinds of moves to try and get him. Uh, Joshua Kelly lost his fucking job. I mean, he just doesn't look very good. Dude, got, Troy got... Main, Troy fucking Main Pope. Pope. <laughs> like, shout out to Troy Main Pope. What is he doing? Who is he? I, I looked him up on Roto World, and the second most recent blurb was like him on the Falcons or something. So like nobody's been talking about this guy, and he just comes out and you just he put up like eighty something yards or ninety something total yards. He's way better than Joshua Kelly, which isn't saying much. But I think the more important thing here is Justin Jackson is who we thought he was. I think last week him going into the game with a knee injury was kind of the reason why he didn't overtake the backfield. Mm -hmm, but this yep. week he had like one hundred fifty total yards, like twenty touches, twenty something opportunities. He's the real deal there. The only thing that's a concern is the fact that he's not out there for like goal line packages. But then again, he breaks big plays. He could find his way in the end of like a 20 to 15 yard touchdown run. So um, as long as the volume is there and he's being get, getting used in the passing game and with Austin Eckler in like what looks to be a loss season for the Chargers, probably not returning anytime soon. Uh, to me, he seems like a back end RB2 for the rest of the season. Yeah, we, I mean, we called it early on in the offseason, like Joshua Kelly's a fucking jag, and he's not very good, and he's kind of proven it this way. Like, Justin Jackson is way more explosive. When you see Justin Jackson versus Joshua Kelly out there, when you see them in the plays, it's like night and day. And then when you see Austin Eckler versus both of them, it's like, oh, it's like, oh my God, just like, the Austin Eckler would have been, I think, a top three running back. Uh, I think I season. think he would be. With Herbert right now, good. the way they're making that fucking offense move, fuck. Yeah, I mean, Justin Jackson, Tremaine Pulp. And I, th I think he'd be doing target. like similar things to what uh, 
Alvin Kamara is doing. Maybe oh, like yeah, a, a little bit of lighter version, but how yeah, yeah. he fucking finishes the game like seven for 85. I think that's yeah, yeah. what we'd see from Eckler. Like less TDs, but like, I mean, Justin Jackson and the, the, he had what, 13, 12, 13 targets to the running backs in this game. So, and they were dominating for most of the time. So they clearly want to use the running backs as part of the thing. So if you're getting Austin Eckler back, if you survive long enough, it's going to be some monster, monster weeks. And, but more importantly, for dynasty purposes, Austin Eckler plus Justin Herbert is going to be a fucking gold mine. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And yeah, if you have Austin Eckler, man, ride that shit. Ride that shit. Absolutely. Um, Mike Williams, though, man, An- another week, five receptions, 99 yards. This guy, I think you tweeted this, Nick, like he does not make non highlight reel catches. It looks like he's getting fucking choke slammed every single time. <laughs> every because time. Every time. It's, it's actually insane. But what do, you, what do you guys think about Mike Williams? I mean, I, I really like what I see from Mike Williams. Uh, they're just watching him play. Uh, analytics and stuff, you know, be damn not that good for him. But, you know, he looks pretty incredible for a wide receiver. One. He looks incredible every year. The problem is he's basically Darius Slayton. So he only yeah. does well when you bench him. And when you start him, he puts up one catch for five yards. Like he did it two weeks ago, right? He yep. up like one catch for five yards after having like 99 and two touchdowns. So then you bench him this week because he's a fraud. And then he puts up 99 <laughs> and a touchdown. So... Uh, to me, he's just somebody that you have to start every week and then you're going to hate it every week. And by the time that you bench him, that's when he's going to go off. <laughs> he's just somebody that I don't have any confidence starting. And it's a cop out. But for me, he's just like a best ball receiver because you never really know when to trot him out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the case with like, uh, like Mike, you tweeted out the thing about Jimmy G. And I was like, you were like, uh, Jimmy G sometimes looks like a franchise quarterback, sometimes a club. Like he, you know, should be like the owner of a fucking Burger King franchise. <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. that's like this, the case for fucking so many players and I think we just have to come to terms with like we're never going to get consistency out of a lot of players and I was talking about quarterbacks because it seems like you people need to have a hot take on like the, a quarterback every single week it's like he's either terrible or he's the best but like with Mike Williams the same shit like listen we know what he is he's exciting he's fun to watch but he's going to give you games where he literally has five yards and then he's going to give you games where he hurts his shoulder four separate times there's going to be <laughs> games where he goes for like 135 yards like we know what Michael what Mike Williams is at this point you know He's fun. Yep. I'm glad that you get to enjoy him, Noah, as a Chargers fan. But like, oh, I love, I love Mike Williams. I like seeing him lie down on the field every like two snaps, just grabbing yeah. at his back and then coming back two seconds later, mossing somebody and then laying down again. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not looking to acquire him anywhere though, or I probably will never draft him, ever. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know, speaking of losing teams, my Patriots uh, lost to the fucking Buffalo Bills due to a late game fumble by Cam Newton. That was painful. Um, for, I guess, you know, for fantasy purposes though, what do you guys think about Damian Harris? No targets, but 16 carries, 102 yards and a tutty, uh, clearly better than Sony Michelle. Is he cut yet? Uh, did we cut Sony Michelle or is he injured? I thought they I just brought know. him back off the IR. Okay. I don't even know what's going on with Sony Michelle, but, but James White with the most James White rushing line ever, two carries for zero yards. Like this team, <laughs> my team fucking stinks, man. Like I, they're bad. I'm, I'm, they're bad. I'm tired of watching. I'm tired of watching. Pitches. It's brutal but, watching too. It's like every other play is like some trick play, and that's like yeah. the only way they can move the ball forward. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, but go. I can't. I don't even want to talk about him. Yeah, I don't even want to talk about the pitchers. I want to move on to uh, the Buffalo Bills. Damian Josh Harris. Allen. Is a, Damian Harris is, is a guy that will get you 15 carries, and it has to be a pristine matchup. And you could feel okay starting him. Like they play the Jets next week, and he'll go like fifteen for sixty-four, and Maybe uh, touchdown. you could flip a coin. You could flip a coin if he gets into the end zone. Like that's how yeah. it works. You yeah. could say like, oh, a positive game script, but like, is that a thing for the <laughs> Patriots anymore? Uh, hey, I don't know. hey, 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 we're not gonna we're not gonna go that far. Uh, I know. With the Pats. Now the Sam Darnold list Jets. You never yeah. know with him. He might just like outsleep his alarm and not be on the team next week. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, Thanks. more interestingly though, Josh Allen looking like more like the Josh Allen of old. Uh, Eleven for eighteen, hundred fifty. Weather yards. was like real shitty this game. I think that's like a good excuse you can use for most of these games. Like yeah, was, yeah, weather was definitely a factor. It was crazy out there. Um. So yeah. So now look, I mean, Zach Moss though he had a breakout game. Fourteen carries, eighty-one yards, two tutties. Devin Singletary did well too. I mean, they were just running train on fucking Patriots defense. We couldn't do anything about it. So. It is what it is. Not too exciting there. Um, I, guess, wait, wait, wait. I got a question for you guys. Who would you rather have the rest of the season? And this might sound like terrible, but I'm going to pose gonna say it. Diggs or Travis Fulgham? No, even better. Zach Moss or Jonathan Taylor? Oh, my Taylor. God. I'm I still going to go with Taylor, but uh, yeah. It's painful. <laughs> it's, painful. It's, it's painful. Moss got all four touches inside the 10. And like that's kind of what we thought was going to happen. We'll probably continue to see it happen. Um, but there are going to be games where like that, you know, they don't have the touches down there or Dodge Allen takes them. And then Zach Moss, you're, you're left hanging with like six points. And I feel like yeah. that's probably going to be the case. Yeah, that's like JT ceiling. So I understand. <laughs> <laughs> true. It's pretty true. 
Uh, pretty true. All right, what let's was. talk about let's talk about something positive. All right, Joe Burrow. No, talked about him being the real deal. He still looks like the real deal. Carried his team to a to one of a rare win with uh, 249 yards on two touchdowns. Uh, Samaj P. Ryan vultured a TD, which probably tilted Giovanni Bernard owners to no end. But Gio came through in the end and put up two touchdowns himself. Uh, they just ran train on this Titans D. Uh, you know, I call them a run funnel D, and that's exactly what they are. They cannot stop the run. Uh, it turns out they can't stop the pass either with T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd both, both going off. I, I really, really like this offense for fantasy purposes going forward between Higgins, Boyd, uh, and Joe Burrow. It's going to be uh, pretty exciting to watch. What do you guys think about, like, Joe Burrow? Where do you guys have him right now in terms of your dynasty rankings? Super Straight fighting. after Herbert. Right after Herbert, have, so where do you have, have him right ahead of so Herbert? Do you have him as QB two? Wow, that, that's <laughs> actually high praise, Mike. No, I think I got him QB eight. I think I have Herbert seven. QB eight. Wow, that's man. You guys are. I think I'm probably a little bit higher on on both these guys. Where do you have him, Nick? I have him at I have him at seven. So there's like the top six. Did you move Dak behind these guys? Yeah. Okay. I didn't move Dak behind these guys. Yeah, yeah, I moved I moved Dak behind uh, Joe Burrow and Her- Justin Herbert. Um, if I haven't done so already, I, I'm, that's definitely where I'm going. And if you're in a rebuilding team, right, like you could make a strong case for both of them over like a Russell Wilson because Russ is like a little bit older. And if you're rebuilding, you don't really want like Russ putting up 40 points in your bench anyways. Where do you have um, Lamar Jackson ranking quarterback? I moved him down this week. After this I moved week. him behind Kyler Murray. I'm thinking about that's moving him too. behind Deshaun Watson as well. Um, I'm gonna update, man. I think I'd rather have Deshaun Watson at this point. That offense is just weird because they're good, but when you look at like the box score and the fantasy points scored, like you just can't predict who's gonna score week to week. Like Willie Sneed had 100 yards, Marquise Brown had like one catch for three yards. It's, it's just tough to predict week to week. I think I moved him to five. I think I moved him behind Watson and Russ and uh, yeah, I mean and Kyler sense. obviously too. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah, I have Dak sense. right behind that, and then the two rookies. Yeah. Um, but sense. you know, did you know the Bengals were without their entire offensive line this game? Yeah. Yeah. That is- insane yeah they it's lost like, their the biggest loss though was their uh six-time champions and final mvp michael jordan uh that was a huge loss <laughs> huge blow to the team leadership wise <laughs> it's just flu game yeah the flu game uh, um yeah burrow burrow is just doing burrow things man he just keeps doing what people thought he was going to do and um unlike jt we are uh, going to get a solid return on investment for him so he's exciting on the flip side of the ball we have Corey davis continuing to do his Devonte parker uh campaign eight for 128 and a touchdown um he's been really really good his worst game of the year is like double digit fantasy points still in ppr leagues and uh i just like continue wanting to say like he's not going to do it again this week but he keeps doing it so i feel like ryan Tannehill was just maybe the missing piece for Corey davis here and just um i love ryan Tannehill, bro i, I keep moving him up my rankings oh, baby too. Yeah, Big Corey Davis for the target hog, too. They played three games together, A.J. Brown and Corey Davis, and A.J. Brown hasn't out-targeted him in any of them. I think it was like 8, 10, and 10 for Davis, and like 8, 7, and 8 for A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown's obviously like the best receiver there, but anytime you're seeing double-digit targets or like anything close to that in an offense like the Titans, um, I wrote up the waiver wire article. He's still less than 60% owned in uh, Yahoo leagues. To me, he's like a high-end wide receiver three because he brings that consistency week to week, either 60 yards or a touchdown every single game thus far. I know he's a tough slate upcoming playing like Indianapolis a few times in Baltimore, but he's done it against Pittsburgh. He did this past week. Like obviously the Bengals don't have a great defense, but um, being part of the Titans offense, I don't think it really matters how tough of a defense you're facing because with Ryan Tannehill behind center, uh, you're going to be moving the ball out. You're going to be in scoring opportunities. And I think he's going to be on the end of a lot of those. Yeah. Late career breakouts, man, between Devontae Parker and now we got Corey Davis. I was obsessed with Corey Davis as a prospect. And like probably like way overpaid for him, but it's, it's definitely kind of encouraging to see him. I mean, he needed Ryan Tannehill to kind of unlock him. And I think the interesting here is like last year, right? Corey Davis was viewed as a wide receiver once. AJ Brown was getting the softer coverage, but now it's very clear that AJ Brown is a top dog. So you know, Corey Davis could benefit a little bit from that from that uh, softer coverage. It does hurt uh, John o. Smith, right? Who's kind of having a massive breakout. We thought that target concentration would be pretty focused between AJ Brown and Corey Davis uh, and. Johnny Smith, but clearly Corey Davis deserves well. And this is it. This is a low, lower volume passing offense. So it kind of hurts him on that front. Um, but yeah, I mean, if Corey Davis is still in your waivers, definitely go grab him. And in Dynasty, um, you know, what do you guys are you guys looking to buy Corey Davis? Or are you guys looking to mainly just hold him? Or what are you guys thinking? Uh, it's gonna be interesting because they didn't pick up his option. So he's without a doubt gonna end up somewhere new. Yeah. And uh, 
to be honest, I don't know. I, that that's probably a, a, a downgrade in in value for me when it comes to him. I'll, I'm I'm intrigued. I mean, maybe he's the one who ends up in in Green Bay next year or something. Yeah. And I, I think that could be a fun landing spot. But that's like one of very very few spots that we'll actually be able to get excited about. And I know we yep. probably mentioned like seven different receivers possibly going to Green Bay and. You know, not everybody can get there. But in terms of, like, just something you touched on, like the volume, I'm not really worried about uh, the volume being, like, low in the passing offense anymore because it's such a funnel. Like, they don't yeah, yeah. have a running back that they throw the ball to, and they don't have a third receiver that they throw the ball to. So if Davis and uh, A.J. Brown are going to do, you know, that uh, their best, like, Demarius Thomas, Eric Decker thing where they just combine for 50 to 55% of the targets every every week, like, they'll be fine. I don't th- Like, even if Ryan Tannehill throws 27, 28 passes, like, they're going to get the majority of them. Yep, definitely. I mean, speaking of the Packers, though, Dalvin Cook just fucking just bent him oh over God. and took him to town. 30 carries, 163 yards, three touchdowns on the ground, two receptions, 63 yards, and a touchdown through the air. Dalvin Cook is fucking incredible. And if he had zero health concerns, I would have no problems with someone putting him as the running back one. He's just that good. I mean, he is, he is in my opinion, you know, we talk about this a lot. I mean, Zeke obviously stinks, but You know, I talk about Chubb being the best pure running back in the NFL. I think Dalvin Cook is definitely right up there with him. Just watching him run, like, he looks like a gazelle. Like, the way he cuts and gets back up to top end speed is great. And he, unlike Jonathan Taylor, he's got vision for fucking days. And he sees, like, way ahead. And trying to tackle this guy in the open field is just unspeakable. I mean, I texted you guys uh, during the game, like, where you guys would have him uh, if there were no health concerns. And I think most of us had him as, like, top three. Um, and just we see the run, Vikings running game and their entire offense uh, basically and just runs through Dalvin Cook, right? So Dude, they had 34 carries to 14 pass attempts. Yeah, like that might be an NFL record, like in terms of <laughs> in terms of run rate. That's absurd. They don't. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, I guess it's the Green Bay defense, but Dalvin Cook is just holy shit. Yeah. You're worried about uh, Adam Thielen rest of the season. I know his schedule gets a lot tougher. These past few weeks have been like plush matchups. And the volume just isn't there if they're going to keep beating Dalvin Cook like they did in the beginning of two, uh, 2019. And it looks like Dalvin Cook's just taking over the reins as the workhorse, obviously. But like 30 to 35 touches a game, I'm not sure there's going to be enough to feed Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. Yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, but at the same time, like they're not going to enjoy this type of game script, like you said. So yeah. also it was kind of weird because like, you know, Aaron Rodgers kind of had a pretty down game too against a pass funnel defense. Um, so like they didn't really put up points on their side, except for Devonte Adams who went absolutely fucking ham again. Um, clearly going to be the wide receiver one of the season, but uh, yeah, I, just, I think game script is just not going to be in their favor going forward. And I do think their defense still stinks. So like, it, it's like wide receivers, man, unless you're, unless you're a clearly Devonte Adams or something like that, like you're just going to see like a lot more up and down and volatility. Um, like they just didn't really need Adam Thielen and they didn't really need Justin Jefferson either. Yeah. I'm not too worried about the passing game over there. I think like you just kind of have to take with the, this kind of game with what their season is where, you know, you know, it's going to come every three or four games and uh, you kind of factor that in. Yeah. Jamal Williams though, man, workhorse, workhorse. Without, he might uh, not be out there Thursday. Yeah. Fucking AJ Dillon, his COVID. only positive contribution was a positive COVID test uh, on the season infecting Jamal Williams. Uh, fuck that guy, man. The only thing he can fucking catch. <laughs> the cool. only thing he could catch, the only positive result he could get. Um, but yeah, not, not too much to go around on that side other than, like we said, Devontae Adams is a fucking like, beast. He's unstoppable. Uh, didn't have many yardage, but like, did you, I don't know if you guys watched the game, but like, he is the best released off the line uh, that I've seen in the NFL. And, you know, he made. He made Chad Ochocinco cry with his routes, and we can see why. He's just – this guy's a fucking stud. Uh, if you have him, ride him, enjoy him. Um, you know, not much more to be said there. I think – Like, you touched on A.J. Dillon. Why don't we cover a few other uh, rookie running backs that are doing really well this year in the Colts and Lions game? Yeah, yeah. Let's take a look at the Colts and Lions game. Uh, I, you know, I kind of tweeted about this. Jonathan Taylor, we already talked about it. The pain is real. I think they did come out. Frank Reich did come out and say that he had an ankle injury. We don't know if that's real or not, but what we do know is that Jordan Wilkins looked better than him uh, while he was out there. So that's not something that you like to see. Um, Jonathan Taylor, I mean, dude, just just a total disappointment. Am I out on him? No, I'm not. Are you guys out on him? What are you guys thinking when it comes to Jonathan Taylor? For this uh, season, it's, it's looking sketchy for me because he's been given the opportunities. I mean, week two against Minnesota, he saw like 20 first half carries. I think he ended the game like 26 for like 100 and a touchdown. And then since then, he's been putting up like 50 to 60 yards a game. This week, 11 for 22, coming out of the bye, which we thought he was going to get a heavy workload because they're coming out of the bye, like we saw with DeAndre Swift coming out of the bye. Uh, they decided to feed him. He had a huge game. 
against the Lions defense that stinks, and he put up that type of performance, whereas Jordan Wilkins went off. And I know Naheem Hines, like, probably will never do this again until he does it again in five weeks, like we said in week one. Um, and he played, like, 16 snaps. I'm just worried because it's a timeshare on an offense that I just don't trust. They put up 41 points, and their defense looked good. But anytime Phillip Rivers is behind center, I just don't trust you. And the fact that they're using Trey Burton – as, as a wildcat quarterback, like Mike, I remember a few weeks back in the episode without Nick, I'm like, I'm a little worried. They're using Trey Burton on the goal line. You're like, well, they're not going to do it again. Guess what? They did it a fucking again. And he scored again. So uh, it just seems like everybody in this offense that lines up behind Phillip Rivers is finding pay dirt, except for the guy that they spent second round capital on who runs a four, three, unless there's five guys in front of him. Then he runs like a two, two and falls down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's actually a two, two is good. good. So I don't know what I'm talking about. I moved Taylor down, uh, a little bit in my in my dynasty rankings for sure and i have zero confidence going forward i'll still look at him as like a low-end rb2 but like what it's gonna need at this point it's a committee i think i i still think he'll lead it but he's gonna need something big to break away like he's a, he's gonna need a big breakaway run he's gonna need to you know rip off like a 75 yard touchdown run in one of these games upcoming for him to like re-emerge as as the lead back now um so we'll have to see how significant the ankle injury is but i don't know it, it's it's fucking ugly out there yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, and then speaking of ugly, let's go to the other side of the ball. DeAndre Swift, six carries, one yard. Adrian Peterson, five carries, seven yard. Nick, you tweeted this. Jamal Agnew with one carry and 11 yards led the entire Lions offense in rushing yards. It is disgusting out there. I mean, I tweeted about this as well. Like, you know, people were big mad about DeAndre Swift on the timeline. And I was just like, dude, like, what do you guys expect? This is this is yeah. the Matt Patricia effect. I mean, this is why I was worried about him coming into the season. You just got to hope. You just got to hope that Matt Patricia gets canned after this year. And he's kind of well on his way to doing that. Because, like, as long as he's there, man, like, DeAndre Swift is just not going to get unleashed. Like, I don't care what people say. It's just it's just not happening. Um, but, yeah, I don't know what you guys are doing with DeAndre Swift. But, like, in terms of season-long season leagues, it's going to be a tough, tough, like tough to put him in your lineup. Yeah, I think one, uh, the Colts when Darius Leonard is healthy is just a unit you can't run the ball against. So uh, I don't want to pin too much of the efficiency on that, but like they are actually an elite run defense. And um, and I didn't expect much much from Swift in this game. I, I yeah, it's man, I don't know. It's a it's a confluence of events, I guess. Like you know if. If AP was never signed, like Swift, I think would have gotten the the workload. So I think it's going to depend on what they do with AP in the off season. Um, I, I think there's a really good chance that Swift does go into the season next year as as the guy and as a starter. And if um, if that's the way it goes, like I'll be really confident in him next year um, if Patricia is still there. But he does go in as as the one. This this off season really killed him in terms of like momentum for him going into the season. But as far as yeah. the rest of the season. Schedule definitely lightens up, like Vikings, Washington, Carolina, Houston. Um, so some definitely winnable defenses to play against over the next month or so. But you can't really have confidence in him, man. It's the same thing with all of these rookie running backs. It's it's a split for sure. Um, he might have a big game. You get lucky if you throw him into your lineup. I think he'll get a little more involved in the passing game going forward. If Kenny Galladay misses some extended time, fucking TJ Hawkinson is going to keep ripping it up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, Swift is what he is at this point, unfortunately. What do you guys make of the Kenny Galladay news? Because apparently, like, Saturday, he yeah. didn't show up to, like, the team meetings, but then apparently he did, and it was a fake report. But then also he's had contract disputes, and now he has, like, a non-contact hip injury. Do you think that's kind of, like, a farce just because they want to get him gone and they didn't want to play him to get – they didn't want him to get injured in the second half of the game? Or do you think, like, he's actually injured and he's going to be out for a few weeks? Because I, I have no clue what's going on there. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, it looked like he's injured, but who the, who the fuck knows, man? Um, I think it was a real injury. I don't. Yeah. I don't think it was. I don't, I don't I think, think they're was... trying to get rid of him, man. Like, I mean, Kenny Kenny G's been a been a baller uh, for them. You know, Granny's been hurt a lot this year, but when he's in the field, like he's he's pretty damn good. Yeah, I, th I think he'll be out. I mean, he's already been ruled out for this week. Um, and then we'll see. The hip and the groin are kind of like the same injury. Most people yep. say so. It could be just like a strain that's one to two weeks. <laughs> Might not be a long term thing. Um, I'm not too worried about Kenny G when he's healthy. Yeah. One positive news, though, is TJ Hawkinson. Uh, that was my pick for the late round tight end out of all the darts. And he is currently the tight end four uh, on the season, both on a totals and points per game basis. He had seven, sorry, seven catches off 10 targets this, this week, uh, 65 yards. I mean, he's not winning you leagues. So you still like, it's really Kelsey or bust, basically Kelsey Waller or bust right now, but he's putting up like 12.5, 12.4 points in PPR leagues. Now with Kenny Galladay out, he's been getting a lot of the end zone looks. Um, so if TDs start going his way, I mean, I think this is going to be a wheels up for TJ Hawkinson. 
for sure. Um, let's see. I don't. I don't even think we need to talk about the Browns and Vegas, uh, Vegas Raiders game. That was that was just an awful game to watch. Um, what what what's the deal with Jacobs? How do you feel about Jacobs right now? I felt I mean, really Jacobs. really strong about him going into the year, and yeah. uh, like thirty one carries and o- like only being able to put up twelve point eight fantasy points. It's 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 kind of gross out there, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know when things are ever going to turn around. He's just not getting targets. I mean, that was, that was the issue, right? Like, coming in, we were worried about the target volume. And after week one, it looked like he was about to get unleashed. He was kind of getting involved. And then, you know, right back to whatever he was normally. So, he's, he's basically, you know, Derrick Henry right now without, without the touchdowns, unless start, touchdowns start breaking his way. Um, but, like, he I mean, wasn't – he's not really even – he's honestly getting more receptions and targets than I imagine. We're not even halfway through the year, and he's on pace for – uh, right now he's probably on pace for like 55 to 60 targets. If you told me at the beginning of the year, I'd be pumped, but like his rushing totals are, I mean, it's like three, three yards of carry, 3.2, 3.3, 1.7. Like he's just not good on the ground. And a lot of it could be a tribute. They lost their O-line this week yeah. too, right? Uh, did they? Brown is out. Yeah. Just Trent Trent Brown, Brown yeah. like they like injected air into his fucking blood and almost killed him. So yeah. he, <laughs> he was out. <laughs> Freaking NFL team doctors are just so shit this year. It's like out straight of control, up killing yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just been an odd year. He's not producing really on the ground where you expect him to. He's had two good games, and they both come with multi-touchdowns in them. So that's, like, kind of why he produced. But outside of that, I mean, yeah, he hasn't uh, he hasn't really done much. So, yeah. I'm, like, I'm kind of nervous going forward. At what point, you know, for, like, Dynasty, at what point do you just say, you know, they're not really going to get him involved the right way? Or, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's, it's I'm, not, I'm not too concerned still. I mean, he's still young. I just, I want to see him play out the season healthy. I think that'll be a key hurdle that he has to clear. Yeah. Um, but like, I mean, not everyone's Delvin Cook, you know, like you're going to have these like boom, more boom bust weeks with guys like, guys like um, Josh Jacobs. That's why I prefer like Miles Sanders. Right? Like Miles Sanders is going to be more involved in the passing game compared to Josh Jacobs. So that's why I have Miles Sanders ahead of him yeah, uh, in my rankings. Right. But you kind of just take, you got to roll the punches, man. He's on, I mean, he's on pace for 377 touches this year. Yeah, I mean that 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 shit doesn't come very often. So you got to just go for the touches. And he is talented, man. Like, look, he's had a couple of bad games for sure, but I still I still believe in the talent. I think he's pretty good. Yeah, he found uh, some inspiration on the other sideline. He had three straight goal line carries, got stuffed at the one, and then he winked at Nick Chubb. So uh, that was a little bit tough <laughs> for him. Would have had a much bigger game if he converted any of those. Would you guys rather have Josh Jacobs or James Robinson the rest of the season, knowing that Jake Luton is the fucking quarterback now? Ooh, that's a good question. Good question. Uh, I, rest of the season, season, I want James Robinson. I will take Robinson as well. I'm big on James Robinson. I think I talked about this a little bit on Market Watch Mondays, but like, I think you know people are really worried about like, oh, like now they're gonna stack the box against James Robinson. I think like people don't realize stacking the box is like a function of play calling on the offensive side of the ball. And Jaguars are still top six in eleven personnel, so three wide receiver sets. So as long as they're calling three wide receiver sets, you can't really stack the box. So like. They're still NFL players, right? You can't leave Chris Conley open. They'll still kind of get the ball back. So I'm not worried about James Robinson. He at least we know he's definitely involved in the in the passing game. He's got yeah. 100% uh, workload on the goal line as well. Uh, so look, I still love James Robinson. I love I freaking love James Robinson. I don't I don't care what anyone says. I love James Robinson. I'm, I'm like glad James Robinson. I feel too. like I need to get you a jersey, a James Robinson jersey. Dude, do it. I'm, I like will wear that. Sell shit. Those? That's they sell Jaguar jerseys. Like not even the James Robinson. I'm ready to I'm ready to hang up hang him up as a Patriots fan and convert over to a James Robinson stan uh, and Jaguars fan. So Oh, I don't know about the second part. Calm down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> next next up we got the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh steamrolled the Jets as expected. Patrick Mahomes had a very Patrick Mahomes esque game. Four hundred and sixteen yards, five tutties. Bro, there's literally nothing to talk about in this game. Yeah, there's nothing to talk about here. I guess I mean Travis Kelsey. No, 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 no. <laughs> there is literally nothing to one. talk about in this game. Travis Kelsey. Tied Let's talk one. about Tua's fucking uh Tua's debut. He didn't have to do much. I mean, like they no. shot on him. I mean, he had a tough. He didn't defense. do shit. He, he didn't, didn't do, do anything. A fucking goddamn thing. He got eaten alive on his first drop back. Yeah. The touchdown he threw to Parker was a f- an unbelievable catch by Parker. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. Like oh, Ramsey was draped all over him, and he and he still made the catch. I mean, th- to be honest, like this just like the Dolphins team. We've said this before, and I'll say it again. Like, I think they are doing it the right way. It's incredible they will turn it around within one within one year to go from like a losing culture uh, that people were basically accusing of tanking uh, purposely into like a more winning culture, taking down the Rams, basically blowing them out. The defense is lights out. I mean, this is the this is the impact that having two shutdown corners can have for you on defense, right? You got, you got Xavier Howard on one side and then you got uh, Byron Jones. Name? Yeah. Byron Jones on the other side, locking guys down and their special teams came through their defense came through Tua 
didn't do anything. Look, didn't look that good at all, to be honest, against a tough defense. So would remains to be seen uh, what's going to happen going forward. I guess the, the one interesting here, I think, for dynasty purposes, though, what is your take on Miles Gaskin? Because everyone is scared to invest in him because they think the Dolphins are going to draft another running back. Personally, I think, you know, we all thought Dolphins are going to draft running back this season. Clearly, they're too smart for that shit, and they're investing in the position that really matter. And Miles Gaskin has actually been pretty good. So I'm actually pretty comfortable, like, just grabbing him. Like, Miles Gaskins and James Robinson are two, two guys that, you know, people are going to continually write off because of lack of draft capital. And for right reason, you know, that's a big risk. But if you're a contending team, like, what are you guys willing to pay as a contender for Miles Gaskins? I pay a second for him. I just think investing in a first, like, as you always say, Mike, the first round picks, their value, like, either maintains or rises. A guy like Miles Gaskin, they can sign a bum. Like, even, I know they have Jordan Howard right now, but if they were going to sign a Jordan Howard-esque running back in the offseason, his value is just going to decline, whereas a first round pick is only going to rise from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I would I would give up a second round. I think I would give up a second round for Gaskins even if I wasn't a contender right now. He's yes, like sir. someone I want to have on my team. I'm with you. He keeps moving up my rankings. And it's just like there's just there's no skip in there's no skip in the heartbeat of, of the amount of touches that he's getting. It's not like every once in a while he just gets like a nine carry game and Matt Breida takes eleven carries and you're like, oh, you know what, there might be something there. It's like week in, week out, this dude's getting twenty touches and you're like Maybe they just really believe in him. Brian Flores is going to be the coach for the long, long term. If he likes Gaskin now, I'm sure he'll continue to like him next season. And Gaskin's been like efficient for the most part, been really good on all three downs. Yep. Uh, I don't see a reason, like you said, to invest in a running back um, when they have a guy like Miles Gaskin who's playing really well. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm definitely on board with Gaskin as a, as an RB two in Dynasty right now. All right, yeah, so, I think yeah, if they were going to invest in a running back, it would have been this year, right? They had like three first round picks and it was a low to running back class. Obviously, they wanted to rebuild like their offensive line and other pieces, but um, I would have thought that they would have done it this year. They didn't. And I think Miles Gaskin has shown enough to be a three down workhorse. Although next year, I would be surprised if he is going to be a three down workhorse. They're probably going to bring in like a Jordan Howard type or maybe even a complimentary back like a Matt Burita, but like a better version of them. Um, but I do think that he's a good fit for this offense. And I think he's going to grow with Tua and just see a bunch of targets out of the backfield. To this point, he's on pace for 80 targets and 69 receptions. So uh, he's basically yep. a very shitty version of Alvin Kamara, which I'm not trying to like make it a slight to Miles Gaskin, but to me, he's like a high end RB2 going forward. Yeah, yeah I like sure. Gaskin a lot. Um, Dobbins. Dobbins. Wait, hold on, hold on. Before we move on, Dobbins, though, let's, uh, let's take a look at the other side of the ball. This is one of the wildest stats I've ever seen. This is Cooper ridiculous. Cup, 21 targets, 11 receptions, 161 passes for Goff. 61 passes for Goff. Um, I, I, there is a bit of light on Cam Akers. I don't know if you guys saw that run, but he looked uh, he looked pretty yeah, damn good on the that. The run was beautiful. Run. Henderson's actually, gonna be back though, and Akers gonna be back in the doghouse. I'll put no I'll put for sure, for sure. But I but I saw a thread today, and you know, Darrell Henderson has looked pretty decent. But in terms of the advanced metrics, uh, in terms of like Drew Great and all that stuff, he actually hasn't been that that great in terms of yards created. So there's a, a little bit of an opening for Cam Akers, and I think you know maybe last week was more about pain tolerance and management of his injuries, but. This is a clearly a going to be a lucrative backfield. You know, you can't trust Cam Akers for a season long yet, at, at least not this year. But I think there's some hope uh, going forward. So here's, here's an interesting question, actually, um, that I've gotten in and I've been trying to flirt with. Would you guys rather have Cam Akers or Miles Gaskins in Dynasty? Cam Akers. Man, that's so close. I want to say I might actually have them ranked exactly back to back. I'm pretty sure I have Akers ranked higher, although I don't feel like I should anymore. Like, I... I don't know. I think they, I also agree with you that I don't think Darrell Henderson, I know you're talking about advanced statistics. I liked, like I own him in a few spots and I like owning him. And I think he's like the best back there for them right now. But I actually don't think he's been anything special despite like him being yeah. efficient. I don't think he's like, he's looked good at times, but consistently I don't think he makes great plays and he's had plenty of opportunity to run away with the job. People are like, why don't they make him the workhorse? I'm like, dude, he's getting like 19 touches a game. He's just like really not churning out anything uh incredible with them so I, I guess i'll go with acres just because the upside is so so high with a guy like acres but like you have to be a little bit concerned that we're this far into the season into his rookie season and he hasn't made any sort of dent or impact 100 percent, 100 percent concerned um but i'm frankly i'm still a believer i'm trying to acquire him i think it's a good time to buy so if you guys are out there willing to take that risk definitely worth it but yeah speaking of running backs man jk dobbins the god what did you guys think i mean i thought you know, I wanted to start the dance party. Um, his target volume is obviously still a concern with Lamar there, but he looked really, really good. And part of that is because of Lamar. You know, we talked about this in the offseason, Noah, is like how good of a marriage that is between having Lamar and 
and having um, Dobbins there because he kind of just like transitions pretty seamlessly from from the type of offense he ran in college. But he looked really freaking good. Like every time he got the ball, he was getting yards after contact. He was breaking. He was juking guys. He's breaking ankles. Um, are you guys comfortable starting him for the rest of the season? And where do you guys have him ranked for 2021 in terms of the rookie running backs? I think for me, honestly, he's, he's challenging. God, I hate that shit. Uh, I think he's challenging <laughs> Clyde over to Lair. I just think that the talent he's shown, like the way he runs, you can't be a linebacker and be happy about it because you think you tackle him and then like his shin is one inch off the ground and he just keeps running for 20 more yards. Like that run he had off to the right side of the line and he just like fell down but didn't fall down and picked up like 40 yards. It was disgusting. I haven't moved up my rankings at all. After I haven't updated my rankings this week. But for me, he's got to be like fringy top 10 just because the marriage that he has, as you said, Mike, with a guy like Lamar Jackson, basically the same thing that he had in college um, every year, except when he was with Haskins. He just, he looks incredible out there. And I really don't care all too much about him getting or not seeing a lot of passing down work. He's there on third down. So he's going to see probably like 20 to 25 catches a season, which isn't great. But I just think the efficiency in that offense, the fact that Mark Ingram is old, uh, Gus Edwards, I think he's like ERFA, whatever that stands for. He might be back next year, uh, but he's obviously the best runner in this backfield. Uh, he's super young. Uh, they invested heavy capital in him and he's just he's super talented so I think um, it's hard for me to say I would still rather Jonathan Taylor over him because Jonathan Taylor has mm-hmm. stunk this year I'm still gonna put Jonathan Taylor over him but I think it's a it's a tough debate between him and CEH 100% yeah, I have uh, Taylor I, I have CEH a few spots below Dobbins now I moved Dobbins up to running back 12 I want to say 12 or 13 and CEH down is like 14 15 so um, Dobbins has definitely moved up. I feel good about him rest of season, but I, I don't know. I, it's really going to be weird when Ingram gets back in there. Like, I don't think he should get an, a single carry more for the rest of the season. Like Gus is clearly better than him. And Dobbins is clearly better than him at this point. Um, but like, again, that's not going to be the case. Like they'll probably throw him in and, and have Ingram take away some carries. It really impressive to do it against Pittsburgh. And now they get another really tough test against, uh, they play Indy this week, I think. Right. Yep. Yeah, they do. Yeah, so that, that should be another good test. But if they could do it against Pittsburgh, they could do it against anybody. Um, so, yeah, like I think Dobbins is pretty much a, a solid, I, I guess like a back-end RB2, high-end flex play for the rest of the season. I think Gus is also in that range. Um, obviously, he takes a hit when Ingram comes back, but I feel good about both of them. Do you guys have uh, – Dobbins and Damian Harris are like the same exact situation, except I have a little bit more confidence in the Baltimore offense getting J.K. Dobbins going than the Patriots keeping Damian Harris out there consistently. Do you guys uh, would you guys rather have J.K. Dobbins or Ezekiel Elliott in Dynasty? Fuck, I'm gonna go with Zeke still. I'll take Zeke too. If Dak is, I expect Dak to be back and and fine next year. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah. so I'm I'm good with Zeke there. How about Tony Pollard or J.K. Dobbins? Tony Pollard, best running back in that backfield, apparently, right? <laughs> After Danucci, I, I hate those tweets so much. <laughs> it was like, wait, it was like seven for forty. It was like his best game of his career. <laughs> All right, Daniel Jones, calm down. All right. Uh, any other games we want to talk about? I think that's it, man. That wraps it up for this week. Um, we're not going to talk about the Bucks and Giants because this game stinks, and it's in the second half, and the score is 7-3 Giants. Just gross. Just gross overall. Um, we'll be back with you next week on another episode. Make sure you guys check out all the videos we got for you this week. Make sure you smash that subscribe button. Hit the thumbs up. Follow Nick. Follow Noah. Follow myself. Follow the channel. Subscribe to both of our channels. Make sure you subscribe to Bunk Bed Breakdowns as well because we're putting out shit on there. Noah's talking to people. He's uh, having like having Zoom calls with people, showing them and showing them his titties, and doing uh, real questionable like hooker prostitute shit. <laughs> yeah, doing some real questionable shit. But if you guys want to get on that ride, uh, make sure you follow us. And, uh, so that's all we got for you guys, man. Peace. Peace.